Cybos. Enabling the digital economy. So thank you everybody for being here this afternoon to hear this co-authored research. And my co-author is also from Seattle University, Kathy Zuling Chow. And I'd, we, both Kathy and I would like to express our gratitude not only just to the Swift Institute, but also um, to Peter Webb and also Nancy Murphy for their encouragement and support in this research as we've, as we've gone down the path. So I'm going to let you read this quote. Um, both of them are very optimistic outlooks on the future of fintech. One is from Governor Mark Carney of the Bank of England, and one is from the CEO of Alibaba, Jack Ma, about what fintech has the potential to do. Just while you're reading that, I'm just going to explain a little bit of why I decided to delve deeper into looking at fintech. Um, apart from teaching in banking and financial institutions, um, I also teach the history of financial crises. And one thing I'm always interested in looking at is what happens in the immediate aftermath of a financial crisis. And one common feature is that there's always a loss of trust in the financial system or banking. And, you know, FinTech has sometimes seen aspects of it as a reaction to the 2008 financial crisis. And there was one paper I came across by Tom Philippon of NYU where he had examined the costs of third-party financial intermediation in the United States over a 130-year period. And he found that they had continued to average around the 2% mark. They hadn't really come down that much. And I remember at the time, I, um, Kathy and I were looking at Alipay and comparable tr financial services in the US versus, say, Alipay. And we found that in some instances, Alipay transaction costs were 0.6 of 8% versus 2 to 3% for the corresponding service in the United States. So we wanted to delve deeper into why, the, why there was such a difference and why these markets have evolved in such a different manner. So this is the most recent data we have from Statista on fintech investments worldwide. Uh, since 2008, we've done two two-year forecasts in there as well, and it's very clear that billions of dollars of investments have poured into this industry since 2010. I mean, what we're looking at here on the graph right now is a $3.6 trillion market worldwide, with about 12,131 fintech startups around the globe. Fintech initial public offerings have become more commonplace. And we have at least 27 fintech unicorns where their value, valuation is at least a billion dollars right now, including China Rapid Finance, Urundai, Alibaba and Stripe, to name a few. So, whoopsie, went too fast. So just to give you an overview of this paper, um, Kathy and I compare the evolution in, of fintech in China versus three Western markets, the US, the UK and Sweden. Now, the reason we chose these four particular markets is that they all represent very different legal in terms of legal origin and legal code, so very different legal frameworks and very different cultural frameworks. So, for example, if you look at the law and finance literature that's out there, the law and finance literature says that English common law countries tend to offer the strongest degree of creditor and shareholder protection. They also tend to offer the most efficient courts and strongest accounting standards. And China, if you go by the law and finance literature, China is a very interesting counterexample of what we expect to see. It's in the primary stage of social, socialism where the state is in charge of access to capital, investment decisions, and stock market listings. So we were looking at this combination of state power and capitalist tools, because there's been two consequences of that. A huge underserved market and historically low bank deposit rates in China. So the three particular fintech areas we focus on in this paper are peer-to-peer -peer lending, mobile payments, and artificial intelligence. And not only is China right now leading the world in fintech, 
It's really moved beyond the tipping point, but it is also leading these three fintech areas as well. So there are four, fee, four key factors driving financial innovation in these four markets that we examine. There's changing consumer behaviour and expectations right now, particularly amongst the millennial generation. Artificial intelligence, cloud computing and big data have all created a more affordable infrastructure. There's also the promise of digital currencies. Many central banks are exploring the possibility of a central bank digital currency and its role in the payment system and investment and banking. Mobile phone technology and other improved access have also lowered the barriers to entry in the financial services industry. And if you look at China, you've got this expanding middle class that has an unprecedented toleration for technological innovation, particularly when it comes to financial services. And you've got a huge funding gap in part of the Chinese population. So we became fascinated, not only just in the, the potential of fintech to reduce information asymmetry, mitigate risk, reallocate capital, and maturity, transform, tra maturity transformation, we wanted to look closer. So out of a $3.6 trillion fintech market around the world right now, this is again from Statista, the current data we have for 2018, with regards to China, the United States, and the United Kingdom. So the China we've got at about 1.6 trillion relative to about 1.3 trillion in the United States. And again, we look at Statista for the leading fintech transactions globally in 2016. Ant Financial is clearly leading the pack here. And so one of the things that Ant Financial has really succeeded in doing has been to address this largely underserved part of the Chinese market. So for example, I mean, look at their mission statement. It's basically, the mission statement is five words, bring the world equal opportunities. And part of fulfilling that mission statement at Ant Financial has been, like, take what they've done with Alipay and Sesame Credit. So if you look in the United States, 90% of the adult population in the United States has a credit score. But if you go and look in China, the People's Bank of China really only have data on about a third of the Chinese population. So how Alipay has been able, or what Alipay was really encouraged to do, was have its users sign up with Sesame Credit. So they created their own in-house credit scoring model. And by having the Alipay users sign up to Sesame Credit, they were offered more discounts and advantages at, say, retail outlets, restaurants, hotels, and so on. Um, just behind Ant Financial here, you've got Lufax. Com. It's a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform with 29 million users at the moment. We find that there are big differences, particularly amongst the unicorns, in the European case versus the Chinese case. Most Chinese fintech unicorns tend to focus on the business-to-consumer style model, whereas, say, in the Swedish case, they tend to focus more on the business-to-business -business model. I just mentioned that there's this hugely underserved market in China right now. We've got about 432 million Chinese citizens who are currently not banked. But we've got over half the Chinese population are active on social media. So this is a huge untapped base. One of the things that has helped spur the growth of fintech is that, you know, it's a country with the world's biggest e-commerce systems in terms of these parent companies here. So, you know, Ant Financial's parent company was originally Alibaba. Um, if you go back to that previous slide, JD.com was also one of the biggest fintech transactions two years ago. Well, they're owned by Tencent. So you've got the combination of Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent, or what we collectively call the BATs, that have really helped um, in encourage or develop further fintech development. I mean, as an example here, Ali Finance alone has provided small and medium-sized enterprise loans to 409,000 borrowers in China. 
So when I talk about this largely or this historically underserved market in China, and I said in my opening remarks that China's kind of an interesting or a remarkable counterexample of what we expect to see. What does its banking, traditional banking system look like? Well, it's a very multi-layered banking system. You could basically um, consider it in four multiple layers. So on the first layer, you've got the five state-owned banks. On the second layer, you've got five large commercial banks, of which the largest shareholder is the Chinese government. On the third layer, you've got a dozen or so joint stock commercial banks. But it's that fourth layer that's extremely complex and detailed. I mean, amongst other entities, you've got 800 rural banks, 140 city banks and 40 foreign banks, along with thousands of rural cooperative banks as well, and one postal savings bank. But all, on that fourth layer, all of those entities combined historically have only accounted for 2% of the loans, whereas that first layer, the state-owned banks have provided half of the lending, but they've traditionally gone to other state-owned enterprises. So there's this funding gap for small and medium-sized enterprises and individuals. In terms of looking at cultural framework, we have a section in the paper titled, What's in a Name? So take, for example, when you think of the phrase money market fund, you know, if you're looking in a US context, usually names like Vanguard and Fidelity spring to mind, but it doesn't quite work that way in China. Um, so it, the world's largest money market fund right now is Yuibao. Now, money market funds aren't really anything brand new in China. They've been around for a while, but they, re they initially required a minimum investment of 50,000 renminbi and quite strict fi fixed term limits. Now, Yui Bao changed all of that. They ch so you think about this. You're a customer. You've got some money, you could have it idle away in a deposit account, it could earn zero to very minimal interest. Or with a couple of clicks, you could move it into your UEBAO account and it could earn some interest. Insurance doesn't necessarily tra translate either one for one across the Western markets versus China. So when you think of insurance, you think, well, most insurance companies, most of their revenue is generated from selling insurance premiums. Well, the insure tech industry has really just you know, experienced runaway growth in China. But a lot of the insurance industry is based on selling insurance products. They're not necessarily insuring anything, but it's investing in products that usually have about a maturity of a year and earn a return better than a bank deposit. Then you've got this last entity here, WMPs or Wealth Management Products. Now they're quite mainstream right now in China. Now, when you think of wealth management products in the West, you usually think about, all oh, right, that deals with wealth preservation from generation to generation. But in the Chinese market, wealth management products pertain to more of a blended product. So it's a blend of corporate bonds, corporate loans, and loans to banks. And this blended, pro this blended wealth management product will then invest in anything from commodities to foreign exchange, T's to diamond to diamonds that hopefully earn a better rate of return than the prevailing bank deposits. So the first thing we exam the first sector we examine is the peer-to-peer -peer lending sector across all four markets. Now peer-to-peer -peer lending started in the UK. First platform was Zopa in 2005 and this was followed by Lending Club in 2006 in the United States. That was then followed by Prosper and was then followed by Smarva in Germany, and then we had in 2007 the first peer-to-peer -peer platform in China, PPDI. And if we examine the peer-to-peer -peer lending market as a whole right now, the global peer-to-peer -peer lending market, 70% of it, is accounted for by, Chi by Chinese peer-to-peer -peer platforms. In the United States, it's dominated by two vendors, two peer-to-peer two -peer platforms, Lending Club, and prosper. And we then go on to examine how the peer-to-peer -peer business models differ or are similar across the four markets. So the three basic peer-to-peer -peer lending models we address in the paper 
uh, it's known as the traditional or is, is also sometimes known as the pure matching model. So you've got the platform, the borrower and the lender, and the loan's not going to be originated unless it's met within a predefined time limit. Lenders can look at multiple loans at the same time. They've also got an auto-select function as well. The difference, and so that's quite common in the UK, US, and in, in some instances in China with Dianrong. The notary model is a variation on the pure matching model. So there's a matching process in operation, but the platform will partner with a third-party depository institution. So this is quite common in the United States. The best known example is Lending Club. And so the partner and depository institution for Lending Club is a bank based in Utah. And so what these third party depository institutions are able to do, they're able to distribute loans nationally across the United States rather than the platform apply for individual state bank licenses. And the third model, which has been used, if we look at the four markets we examine, has been used more in China and Sweden, is known as the guaranteed return model, where the principal and interest are guaranteed a rate of return. So the really large Chinese peer-to-peer -peer platforms that we examine were guaranteeing rates of return of 12%. Okay? Now, and I could give you a Swedish example, as an example of a Swedish peer-to-peer -peer platform that was um, guaranteeing returns, also of about 12%, um, was TrustBuddy, which was ordered to cease operations two years ago. Now, this practice of guaranteeing return was banned in China in August of 2016, okay? And also just after that, loan sizes were capped at 200,000 won or equivalent to about $30,000. We also examine the types of loans that move on these peer-to-peer -peer platforms as well. So in the United States and the United Kingdom, for example, the peer-to-peer -peer industry has developed more on the basis of consumer loans. In the United States, we've had an increase in student loans on peer-to-peer -peer platforms as well. And in the last few years, um, if we go back to what I said about the pure matching model, you usually think of individuals. Well, in the United States, in the last few years, there's been more of a presence or more of an entry from institutional investors as well. And we also had in 2014, the start of peer-to-peer -peer securitization, or the securitization of peer-to-peer -peer loans, uh, I should say, that was started by Eaglewood Capital. Now, loans on Chinese platform, on, loans on Chinese peer-to-peer -peer platforms tend to be much more diversified. They tend to be focused on the following four segments, consumer loans, small business loans, car loans, and real estate. And the growth of the Chinese peer-to-peer -peer industry has been phenomenal over the course of a decade. I mentioned before that the first peer-to-peer -peer platform we saw in 2007 was PPDI. And the model that PPDI followed was Prosper.com. That's how they started off. Now, over the subsequent decade, if we look at the number of peer-to-peer -peer platforms that were started throughout China, we ended up with about 5,962 lending platforms. Now, one of the things we do look at in the paper, um, we, we do actually examine peer-to-peer -peer data, um, actual platform data, is in the development of this phenomenal growth of peer-to-peer -peer platforms in China, economic status and geography matters. So what we do is that we classify that there are basically 31 economic provinces in China. And we find about 70% of the Chinese peer-to-peer -peer market has sprung up out of five locations. And they're in what we call the first tier cities. So peer-to-peer -peer lending started in the first tier cities, then moved to the second tier and third tier. So the third tier cities are more of the rural based cities. And so the five cities that account for 70% of the peer-to-peer -peer lending market in China are Guangdong, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, and Shandong. What we've also noticed over the past three years, 2014 to 2017, like last year, the market was valued at about 1.2 trillion renminbi. That amount has grown 39 timefold since 2014. 
not only has the volume of peer-to-peer -peer transactions gone up in that, quite substantially in that three-year period, but also the debt outstanding for those peer-to-peer -peer platforms as well. Lending yield has been halved though over that same three-year period. So lending, on average, lending yield has been halved from about 18.5% to 9.4%. And the average debt per peer-to-peer -peer customer has decreased over time. Now that's no surprise, that was really no surprise to us because you had the ban in 2016 which capped loan size at 200,000 won. So that's what we should see. Now, I mentioned that five cities accounted for 70% of the overall Chinese peer-to-peer -peer lending market. Those same five cities also account for 60% of the problematic peer-to-peer -peer platforms in China. So we spend quite a bit of time on this data in the paper. We take available peer-to-peer -peer platform data and this is all the peer-to-peer -peer data we have. So it's done for a seven-year period. You may be well aware that this past summer in China, there was an uptick in failed peer-to-peer -peer platforms, and there's an ongoing regulatory response to that. So once we get the data, we'll, we'll update this table at the end of 2018. But this is the, all, all the available data we have on problematic platforms. Look at this on a cumulative basis. By the end of 2017, we had 4,008 problematic platforms. So what we do is that we classify, you know, why has that platform failed? So there's basically five classifications. And you'll notice the two big factors are the platforms shut down by the authorities or the managers skip town, they run away, okay, or it's gone with the funds. Now, under business transition, that doesn't necessarily mean anything dodgy. I mean, actually, many Chinese companies left their traditional core business, like take Panda Fireworks, the name says it all. They moved into peer-to-peer -peer lending for a while. You have another company like Hongling Capital, okay? Hongling Capital would be one of those figures there for 2017. It decided last year to move out of the peer-to-peer -peer lending market into the more mainstream wealth management product arena. So they really just changed focus and direction. Problematic peer-to-peer -peer platforms is just not unique to one country. We provide a series of mini cases throughout the paper as well that look at why, why these platforms have proved problematic, not just in China, but the US, Sweden, and the UK as well. So I just mentioned Hongling Capital. Hongling Capital really represented the last example of large loans. Eju Bao was an outright Ponzi scheme. It's often compared with the Bernie Madoff. Ponzi scheme. So here in Ezhu Bao, you had about 900,000 investors defrauded of approximately $3.6 billion. And it happened over a very short period of time. Its birth, life, and death were under two years. So why did it grow so quickly? Well, Ezhu Bao, it translates as easy money, um, basically undertook a very aggressive advertising campaign uh, through sports advertising on television and on high-speed rail trains. Its controller, its chief controller later admitted that 95% of its projects were fake. Lending Club has been under scrutiny twice in the last two years. Its CEO stepped down in 2016 after it became public knowledge that, that loans, about $22 million worth of loans, had been repurchased that did not conform to the buyer's requirements. Earlier this year, the Federal Trade Commission accused Lending Club about its no hidden fees policy, saying that it was actually glossing over the 5% origination fees that it routinely charged on approved loans. Sweden has also had its sh share of problematic peer-to-peer -peer platforms as well, in the case of TrustBuddy. TrustBuddy started off as a payday loan platform and moved into the more traditional consumer lending market. Basically, its bad loans outweighed its existing assets. Authorities shut it down. And earlier this year, UK Collateral was ordered to shut down by the UK authorities. UK Collateral dealt with pawnbroking and property-style loans where the underlying collateral was offering jewellery and watches 
And basically the loans were just far too large considering the small investment base of the peer-to-peer -peer platform. And they often guaranteed loans of about 15% rate of return. So then we examined the mobile phone market and this move to going cashless. So of the four ex nations we examined, clearly Sweden is well on its way to becoming the first cashless nation. But that has not been without consequences. There's been a backlash from two sectors, the elderly and the low income. And Sweden announced a parliamentary committee would be set up to investigate this backlash. China has also, I've got some stats coming up on how few cash is now carried um, by citizens. This data we gathered for the change in third party mobile payments versus online payments in China between 2011 this year and what's expected for next year. So this industry, mobile payments, is dominated by two key players in China. Alipay accounts for 68% of the market, and then WeChat Pay accounts for well over 30% of the market. And you'll notice there's this surge in mobile phone payments after 2012, and this was after the People's Bank of China granted about 27 internet banking licenses, of which Alipay was one. So we also look at I mean, and here, the size of the market is about 50 times bigger than the US's corresponding mobile phone market. Part of that has to do with the underlying technology. So a lot of the Western markets utilise in their mobile phone technology near-field communication codes, whereas vendors like Alipay rely exclusively on the QR or quick response code. And simply, this QR code is a lot cheaper to use it, Alipay uses it in one-off transactions that are executed instantaneously. They can be used at point of sales, between mobile phones, or with a QR decal. And to initiate the payment, all you really need is a password and biometric identification. And it's biometric identification or facial recognition where China's really leading the push in artificial intelligence, particularly in financial services. So in terms of China, two prominent technologies are fueling that drive. Not only facial recognition, uh, two key players are face, hashtag, and sense time, but also the push in AI chips. And both the US and you, um, China compete heavily in AI technology. The market's also dominated by the bats. And we've got lots more um, data available on the AI market in China from the Wusheng Institute. But you'll notice here, the US and China have accounted for over 50% of the AI patents filed um, as they pertain to financial services. Actually, all of the four markets we examine are increasing the number of AI patents filed for financial services. It's just that China's doing it at a much faster rate, as is the case for China-backed equity deals for US startups is happening at a much faster rate than US back equity deals to Chinese startups. So can, on our concluding remarks, I mean, we're very optimistic about the future of FinTech in all four markets, but peer-to-peer -peer lending as a whole still hasn't gone through a full business cycle or been fully tested in a high interest rate environment. I mentioned that five cities accounted for the bulk of the problematic peer-to-peer -peer platforms in China, but the next group leading are down towards the bottom of the 31 provinces. So they tend to be the more poorer rural provinces. So how do you maintain financial inclusion in rural areas that are less technologically developed and lack infrastructure? It's expected by 2020 there's going to be a social credit score system in place in China. But that, uh, in response to that, concerns have arisen regarding individual privacy and data security. I mentioned the backlash to the cashless society that's also occurred in, in Sweden. And we have the ever-growing mountain of non-performing loans and debt that I mentioned before, and debt in general. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much.